Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope that today, a week after another week of lockdown, another week after we had celebrated Easter, that you can declare this morning that it is still well with your soul. So last week we celebrated Easter, and it was an Easter like none that we had celebrated before. We found ourselves apart from our families and friends in a way that we are not used to when we celebrate significant times. Now this morning I want us to stay with the Easter theme, as I believe that we can still extract a few more kernels of encouragement from a story that we all know quite well. And it's a story that takes place immediately after the resurrection. And it's a story that only Luke records in great detail. Mark mentions it, but he only mentions it in two verses of chapter 16. Our story is found in Luke chapter 24, and we'll be considering verses 13 to 35. And it'd be great that if you have a Bible handy to keep it open, we'll read a short portion, we'll note some key thoughts out of them, and then we'll move on, we'll read a little bit more, and so we'll work our way through the text. And I would want you this morning to try to hear very specifically what God is saying to you today. Now just before we we read, I just want to remind us again of the context of this particular text. So Jesus had been crucified on the Friday. His body was placed in the tomb. Sunday comes and the women go to the tomb to spice the body. Spices weren't put onto the body so much to mask the smell as the spices are meant to help the body to decay. They are there, but they don't find Jesus' body. Instead, they see two angels who tell them that Jesus is risen. The women go back and they tell the disciples, but the disciples don't believe them. And this is where we pick up our story from this morning. Now, as we meditate on this text, I want to ask that you try and place yourself in this passage of Scripture, if that's possible. Because I believe that there is much that we can apply to our current context today. So let's read chapter 24 and from verse 13. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about 11 kilometers from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? <clears throat> and he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they did not see him. 
as we read this, we can immediately tell, I think, that Luke records the story to us in the form of what appears to be an eyewitness account. There are these two disciples and they are traveling from Jerusalem to a town called Emmaus. And these two disciples would probably have been in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover festival. A festival which lasted seven days. And they would then have witnessed the crucifixion of Jesus on the Friday. The disciples probably began their journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus early on the Sunday morning because they would have been unable to make the trip home the day before. You see, it was forbidden for them to travel on the Sabbath, which is Saturday, according to Jewish law. And so in all probability, they would have set out early morning after sunrise, after having heard the account of some of the women who went to the tomb before dawn and who reported to the apostles that angels told them that Jesus had risen from the dead as he had promised. And after also hearing that Peter and John had found the tomb to be empty. And so these two disciples, they are walking this 11 kilometer journey which would probably have taken them just under five hours. And they have all these things going through their minds. And they're talking about it. And they're trying to make sense of what they had experienced in the past few days. And so while they're walking and talking about everything that had happened, another traveler joins them. And this traveler is Jesus. But they don't recognize him. Now this bit amazes me here. Because here's Jesus who had just two days earlier been beaten. He'd been whipped. He had had a spear driven into his side. He had nails driven right through his hands. He had nails driven right through his feet. Yet here he is walking an 11 kilometer journey. That would have lasted about five hours. Yet the eyes of these two disciples are kept from recognizing him. This to me is another amazing testament to how Jesus is able to make all things new. So these two disciples look visibly sad and Jesus asks them what they were talking about. And they respond by telling him, about Jesus of Nazareth. And this is the part that I would want us to focus on for a moment. They say, we had hoped he would be the one to redeem Israel. Do you see how the disciples here talk about their hope in the past tense? They say, we had hoped. So we see that there was a time when they had hope, but their hope was now gone. There was a time when they were hopeful, but now they felt hopeless. Now as I consider our challenges today, then I believe that some of us could confess today that we may feel something similar. Let me say to you, that if you aren't careful, you may find yourself right now in a season of hopelessness. Our country, and indeed even the world, is on lockdown. There's widespread fear because of the coronavirus pandemic, and it's affecting our lives and the lives of those around us like nothing before. And so maybe this year started out and you were hopeful. You had plans and hopes for what this year would bring. But now, just four months in, it seems that those plans are falling apart. And so maybe you had hoped that this year you would see a return on an investment. 
Or maybe you had hoped that this year you could start a new venture. Or maybe you had hoped that your work situation would improve. Possibly a promotion. But now you're lucky to continue to be employed in the next few weeks, let alone receive a full salary. Or maybe at this time, you simply had hoped that you would receive a full parcel. Or if you were homeless, maybe then you had hoped that you would have a roof over your head as winter approaches. You see, I think that we have something in common with these two disciples today. They had hoped that Jesus would be the one who was going to redeem Israel. They were looking forward to something with confidence that it would come to pass, but now their hopes were dashed. Let me challenge you with this today. Don't allow your current situation to crucify the resurrection power that is within you now. Remember that we are on a journey. We are followers of Christ. We are not ones who had followed Christ once. We continue to follow Christ. And Jesus is leading us on a journey. And I believe today that sometimes we find ourselves being too destination-minded, forgetting that we are sojourners. We are travelers. And so where you are now is not where your story ends. Because he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ, as Paul says in Philippians. Now, if you are a business person, then you would understand how a turnaround time works, as an example. An order is placed, and there's a certain amount of time that is needed to produce the product. A vine doesn't produce fruit on day one. The ground must be prepared, it must be pruned, it must be cared for, and then the harvest comes. Olives must be pressed and processed before you get oil. Ore is mined and processed before you get refined minerals or metals. Clay is molded, it is pressed, shaped, formed, and then it is baked, and then it is ready for use. There is a process at work here, a journey that we are on, in the same way like these two disciples. And as we see in the story here, Jesus spends time on this journey to Emmaus, with these two disciples, expounding on this principle. And we pick up again at verse 25. And it says, And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So Jesus says to these two disciples who are stuck in the crucifixion while they are standing in the presence of the resurrection. He says to them, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things? And then enter into glory. Didn't Jesus have to go through some stuff before he entered into glory? You see, there was a process at work in bringing the Messiah to this place. And so as we read the story, we see that Jesus was even at work with these two disciples on their journey to Emmaus. God was at work in their hearts 
And he is also at work in my heart right now. And he is at work in your heart right now. God isn't dead. God isn't absent. He remains present and at work. And he is ruling and reigning right now. And as we read in the story, Jesus delivers an amazing Bible study. And he cites from memory passages from Moses and the prophets and explains how each of them pertain to himself, the Messiah. And then verse 28 says, So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? For the Jews, the day ended at sundown. And so the next day began with the setting of the sun. So when the Bible here mentioned that, that it was evening, According to the cultural tradition of the time, the evening began actually at 12 noon, when the sun had reached its highest point in the sky and was beginning to descend. And it was the practice at that time to take the main meal at noon. And since the day had reached its midpoint and the sun was now descending in the sky, it would have been considered that the day was descending into the evening, as the scripture says. And so these disciples' statement, urging Jesus to stop and eat them, would have been an understandable display of their hospitality. And so Jesus accepts their kind offer, and he spends time with them. And in this exchange up until this time, Jesus' role is as an honored guest. But at the table, as they, are, as they are reclined there, Jesus unexpectedly moves from the role of guest to the role of host. And now, as the host would normally do, he takes the bread, offers the blessing, breaks it, and he gives it to them. In the intimacy of table fellowship, as Jesus breaks the bread and he offers the blessing, they suddenly become aware of who he is and immediately their hope is resurrected. Jesus is revealed in the breaking of bread. And I believe that something happens when we spend intimate time with Jesus. You know what? You run the risk of missing Jesus if he doesn't look like something that you recognize, something that you are familiar with. And so Jesus may walk beside you unrecognized. Just as Jesus isn't recognized by these travelers to Emmaus, Jesus can be with you right now. And even encourage you in your struggle, in your challenge right now, even though you aren't aware that he is present. You know, the risen Christ is not limited as we are by geography or time or lockdowns or viruses. So what must you do? Let me say it to you. What you must do is you must invite him in. Ask him to come and break bread with you. Ask him to come and explain to you all that the scriptures say concerning himself. Beginning with Moses and the prophets. 
ask him to come. And you know what will happen when you do that? Your hope will be rekindled. And this is what happened to these two travelers, to Emmaus, these two disciples. The scripture says that they felt their hearts burning within. And then verse 33 says, And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. You know, when you meet the real Jesus, there is something that wakes up within you. There is something that is revived within us that compels us to go and tell others. And so let me say to you, go and tell others about this Messiah. Go and tell others about this Messiah who has come to proclaim good news to the poor. This Messiah who has come to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. This Messiah who has come to bring recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And remember this morning, we are all on a journey. We are all travelers. And this story that we just went through now, about this journey to Emmaus, recounts this episode between Jesus and these two disciples on this 11-kilometer journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus. But on the other hand, it also outlines for us the journey that we all take from not recognizing Jesus to understanding what the scriptures say about him to recognizing him for who he really is, and finally to our giving witness of what we have experienced. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. We thank you that those who hope in the Lord will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. We thank you, Lord, this morning that your eyes are on those who fear you, on those whose hope is in your unfailing love. And this morning, as we meet, as we worship you, as we praise you, as we consider your truth this morning, Lord, we ask that you would come and meet with us. Come and break bread with us. Come and rekindle within us a hope. Come and make all things new within us. We eagerly desire to see your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, Amen. God bless you. So we're going to share a few minutes of virtual fellowship um, on a Zoom meeting in the next few minutes. We're going to share that link um, on the Explore Congregation WhatsApp group in the next few moments. So it would be great. It would be awesome for you if you could join with us as we share some time in fellowship, just catching up on where we are at. That would be awesome. God bless you.